Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and I'm super, super stoked about the project, the undertaking that we're going to be starting today with the Acturian Analog. Now, this again, I usually allow Loud Spirit to move me as to which books we should go through. And I've been really on a roll with Tom Kenyon's work. We just finished the Hathor material last week before that we did the magdalene manuscript and now we're going to be talking to the acturian so we've talked to the, ha the hathors and now we're talking to the acturian so i'm super 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 excited once again if you're new here there will be a link to this book down in the description box below how this works on my channel is we look at the material and then we discuss and i'm so grateful for all the comments that you leave in the comment section below because listen as ram das said like legit we are walking each other home and we have been fed a whole bunch of bullshit by the people in charge. And so now it is up to us to untangle all of these, these webs of deceit and figure out who we are, what really happened, what got us to where we are now and actually embrace that friction, right? We talk about friction all the time on this channel. Friction is catalyst. It's the catalyst event. And so I'm really, really excited to be starting this with you guys. I'm also feeling really good today. I was sick last week. If you saw, I think I'm airing it tomorrow. Uh, the woman with the alabaster jar in that reading, I look sick. Like I was not feeling well last week, but I doubled up on my ASEA. I am feeling like a million bucks today. And once again, if you are interested in our sponsorship, the ASEA, the, the ASEA product, Please make sure you do text the number that's one three two one two one six eighty forty seven. That is to Jay with Spiritually Raw. Just put Bryce info in the text and he will contact you because the website is is very hard to navigate. Um, I think the product is growing faster than the website design having a hard time keeping up with it. And so we want to make sure that you get the best price, the best um, product for your money. And so Jay can help you figure out how you can buy wholesale. And so please make sure you text him before you make the purchase, um, just to make sure that you are getting the most bang for your buck. But I'm feeling fantastic. Like I feel like a million bucks this morning. And yeah, so let's do this. Let's get into this. Before we get started, though, I am, as always, let me light my sage here. I am going to be calling in all of the beings of my highest good. I'm going to be calling in Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, Magdalene, Yeshua, which I think Magdalene Yeshua will be making an appearance in this book. I'm going to be asking that my dragons, all of my elementals, every being that's here to protect me, to guide me, to help me, my team, my crew, whatever you want to call them. I'm going to ask that you guys come in to this recording and be here with me. Help me to say the words that need to be said, especially with Magdalene. Help me to say the words that need to be said for your message to come across to help the person watching this right now find what they need to find in order to take their power back and in order to be able to relinquish the bondage in their own lives. I ask that any beings that are here that are not for our highest good, that are here to hurt, to infiltrate, to try to intercept any message, be escorted off of the premises. I do not consent and I revoke any permission that the darkness thinks it has to use my wounds and my soft spots, my weak spots as an entry point into this conversation. You have all permission revoked. You cannot use those, those weak spots in me. You got to go. If you do not go, I ask that Magdalene, Yahshua, and all of the beings of highest good bring those suckers, spirits, human or otherwise, to the throne room of God for judgment. Consent is key, and I don't consent. All right, so let's get started. The Acturia Anthology. Let's just read the back of it, because this is interesting, because we know that Mag Magdalene and Yeshua were Lyred, but here they've also got some um, Acturian genetic DNA as well, which it's interesting. Holly told me that even though I'm predominantly Lyra and I also have other galactic ties too, which I understand that I get we're mutts, right? On this country or in this globe, this world, it's not a globe, is it? The, the world we live in, the earth plane we live in, we're all a bunch of freaking mutts, aren't we? So more that's what makes us so powerful. We have so many different galactic roots, okay? So the back of the book says, once every 20 years or so, a book comes along that totally changes the way you think this is that book this anthology is a collection of what eight octurians have to say including sanat kumara yeshua bin yosef and magdalene from the science officer to their akashic librarian to an octurian warrior 
a medical officer and a meditation master. They bring forward the issues they struggle with, their concerns and their choice about how to further help humanity. It is an expanded view of reality, a higher dimensional view brought to earth by Tom Kenyon's amazing ability to connect and communicate with beings from other dimensions. Octarians are brilliant, fearless, and highly evolved. They have been and will co continue to be our guardians and our protectors. So I know a lot of people in my life have Octarian roots. Apparently, I have a little Octarian roots as well, as well as Lyran. So let's go ahead. And I love in the beginning, they have it dedicated. They say Mary Magdalene. We'll forgive them for that. If you've been on this channel for a while, you know, her name was just Magdalene. It wasn't Mary Magdalene. Mary was supposed to be a dismissive name created by the um, controllers. So we have a quote here in the beginning. It says, your now has become your future. Your future has become your now. Ektara said that. I'm sure that's an Octarian. Octarian encounters. Octarian encounters an introduction by Tom Kenyon. You are about to read something that is truly out of this world, both because it deals with beings that are literally not of this earth and because, well, it's a far-fetched story with other worldly characters that borders on science fiction. Of course, what one person deems to be fiction, another person may deem to be truth. Perception in all things is relative to the perceiver. As someone who values objective truth, I find it truly odd that I am once again writing an introduction to a channeled body of information. Personally, I prefer the more solid work of scientific inquiry and logic. That is because this type of knowledge can be verified objectively. Something either, either is or it isn't. There is no middle ground except, of course, when we are dealing with quantum physics, where things can get a bit fuzzy and unpredictable. Channeled material is different from other forms of information. Sometimes it can be objectively verified, but sometimes not. The whole thing hinges on what type of information we are talking about. In this case, we are talking about a group of intergalactic travelers called the Octurians. An objective verification of their existence is, at best, paradoxical. I will recount the story of these encounters shortly. But before you start to read this account of my personal odyssey from skepticism to acceptance, I strongly suggest that you put what I call the imaginary box close by your side. He talked about this in the Hathor material too. And that's what I love about Tom Kenyon. Uh, the dude's a scientist. So he's like, entered into this world of like the woo woo of like channeling these intergalactic beings but his whole job his whole occupation is founded on science so he's like i know this sounds strange guys and i just love that i love that because I, i'm super out there like i i talk a lot about grounding because grounding and stuff i've had to work on in my life big time and because i would rather live in the woo-woo i would rather live there than here but we come to earth for a reason right so that's why i like about tom kenyon is because he's someone totally different from me but it's so interesting so he talks about this imaginary box in the hathor material as well so the imaginary box is a mental device that allows you to filter and set aside things that sound too outlandish for them to be true i think it's a vital necessity in general in general and certainly when dealing with altered states of consciousness to not swallow something as true just because somebody told you it was true or because you believed it to be true. That's probably no wiser words have been spoken than that. That's hello. That's the great awakening. Don't believe something is true just because a truther told you it was true because 90% of the truth, the truthers out there are paid infiltrators and they're banking. They're hoping that you're just going to take their word for it instead of actually researching for yourself. If I, or the Octurian say something that doesn't make sense to you, just toss it in the imaginary box. Don't accept it as truth. Test it with your logical mind, your personal experiences, and very importantly, your own values. As I have said repeatedly, swallowing ideas without chewing on them can lead to a type of mental indigestion for which there is no instant antacid. And and so now, armed with your imaginary box, I think we are ready to enter into this intergalactic labyrinth 
While the characters in the story are from another world, my first experience of them occurred in a re region of southern France called Languedoc. My French is terrible. <laughs> Feel free to correct me in the comment section. And within sight of a mysterious mountain called Bougarc. Now, here's the thing. I've talked to my friend Nicole about this because my friend Nicole is from New Orleans, so she's highly adept in French. I've studied both French and Spanish in school all throughout school. And the one thing that used to get me, I think French is a beautiful language. Don't get me wrong. I have a lot of French heritage. Like I totally get that. It's a gorgeous language, but you don't say half the word. That's what, we get. that's what got me all through school. I'm like, you just start with the first part of the word and then just kind of tails off. Like you don't say half of it. Right. It's kind of like, here's a trick, you know, like those of us who are old, we learned how to do cursive. I know kids don't learn cursive anymore. If I had children, I would make them learn cursive. But I always tell people, like, if you're not, if you have to write something and there's some words, big words, and you're not totally sure if you're spelling them right, just write them in cursive so you can, like, squiggle it, right? That's how I kind of feel about French. It's just kind of like, I have the word, it's not sad. And I say that from a point of sense of humor, because again, I have a lot of French heritage as well. So I'm not, I'm not bashing the language. It's a, it's a gorgeous, I think French is an absolutely a gorgeous language. I love hearing French. It's beautiful. It's very, there's a lot of melody to it. But yeah, so I know that I'm not pronouncing that correctly, because I'm used to a language where you pronounce most of the words. Very rarely is there like a silent word. So our silent letter. So I apologize if I did not say them right. Anyway, I digress. So reluctant contact. It was a, bl a blistery day in the Pyrenees of southern France, and the valley was soaked. Was soaked. Speaking of English, the valley was soaked in the thick clouds as I began my slow climb up the side of a ridge. I often hiked up the side of the valley because there were paths that led all over the high plateau. The vistas were breathtaking, and there was something exhilarating about being up there. As had often been the case, the twisted maze of trials had en enchan had entranced me, and before I knew it, several hours had passed. It was now late afternoon. The sun was obscured by a dark blanket of clouds as I began a slow walk back to the entrance of the tailhead trailhead that would lead me back down the valley. Coming out upon an outcropping of boulders, I paused for a moment and sat down to view the expanse below me. At the far end of the valley, I could see Mount Ugark. Probably did not say that right. That's okay. Shrouded by thick, dark clouds. Shreds of mist floated across the valley below me, while up on the ridge, the wind was roar roaring in my ears. It was then that my reverie was broken by the distinct sense of a presence in front of me. Although I did not see him with my physical eyes, I had a strong mental impression of him nonetheless. Yo, I think a lot of us know that feeling. A lot of us that are sensitive, I see things. I do I do have the ability to see. The only one that I hear, though, is Magdalene. So I get that. I think a lot of us that are watching this, I know a lot of you guys have, have had the same abilities that I have had that a lot of people, it's very common, actually, to have these abilities. We're just told it's not, we're told we're crazy. But yeah, all of a sudden you have that looming idea as an orb, literally just, I don't know if you guys saw that orb just blew by me just then. Um, a lot of us have this like idea that we're crazy, but most of us, uh, we know we feel a presence. Like I have that, like, I know when somebody's in my house with me watching me, even though in those senses, if they are astro traveling or astro projecting, I can't see them. And so that's why I always say human or otherwise, you know, so, and I can, you can feel if it's good or bad. Like you can often feel that, that sense of whether this person or this being is there to harm you or not. So I get, I think we all know what Tom's talking about when all of a sudden you like know that there's somebody with you. All right. Without knowing how I knew this, that this was the Acturian, I asked him where he had come from. He replied that he was from the Acturian starship, temporarily based inside of Mount Burgok, and pointed across the valley to the stark figure of Burdok off in the distance. I heard him speak inside my mind. I did not hear him with my physical ears, but as with the visual impression, the sense of hearing him speak originated in my mind. Against the backdrop of a roaring wind, his first words seemed to carry a depth and an urgency far beyond the actual words themselves. The winds of change are upon you. Listen, 
change is change can be good but i think for most of us if some intergalactic being that was like presently there all of a sudden said yo the winds of change are upon you that's like the beginning of a stephen king novel i'd be like what the fuck is happening <laughs> so that's kind of a, a very looming thing to hear i would imagine anyway annoyed with the vagueness of his statement i said what do you mean exactly he replied replied rather curtly you and your world are going through a metamorphosis this only annoyed me further it is here for the sake of you reader that i should probably mention my ongoing quandary regarding my numerous encounters with non-corporal beings including angels earth protectors nature spirits interdimensional beings such as the hathors and now it would seem with an alien many of these beings from the other world of perception tended to speak in metaphorical and vague terms that's correct they do and words often carried a sense of urgency or profanity i was well acquainted with the type of archetypal tone which carried a sense of being larger than life and I had grown to distrust this tone of communication since after so many encounters with beings from so many other dimensions, this type of metaphoric cosmic mind speaking bordered for me at least on being cliche. He then proceeded undeterred by my irritation to tell me specific things about my life and my mission. His timing could not have been worse <laughs> because, because I was in the midst of one of my own intellectual morosis where i was questioning everything and while a part of me sensed a feeling of truth in what he told me the rest of me was truly irritated at the concept of missions in general and with he had told me specifically totally get that absolutely totally get that what he told me about myself is of little consequence to this story what happened next is i was livid and I told him in no uncertain terms that he would have to appear before me physically so that I could see him with my physical eyes if we were to continue this ridiculous conversation any further. He replied with some type of mumbo jumbo and it would take too much energy to descend to my level of vibration. <laughs> He's like, I'm not coming down there. Listen, listen, I'm not coming down there. <laughs> or it's like when your parents, when you're, getting in trouble and their parents like don't make me come down there <laughs> so but he could alter the cloud cover in a way that might demonstrate to me that he had an ex existence separate from my own mind which i will say if you ask for signs from the other side they will give you signs i looked up to the sky which was completely obscured by a thick dark cloud annoyed by his sidestepping i asked and what do you propose i will part the clouds and make the sun visible i retorted that i would give him the time that it would take for me to descend the ridge into the valley and walk to labado no more time would i give him than this angry at the entire at the entire affair i began to walk towards the trailhead as i took my first steps into the first several switchbacks i glanced up to the sky incredulously a vague circle seemed to be appearing in a small portion of the cloud cover i couldn't believe my eyes this area of the sky seemed to be slightly lighter shade of gray than the rest of the blanket of clouds that have soaked in the valley could the sun actually be on the other side of this growing circle for some reason still unknown to me to this day i sped up if this was, in fact, a demonstration of this supposed Octurian's powers, I wasn't going to give him any grace. I was still angry with his archetypal vagueness and his comments about this phase of my life's mission. Even as I picked up my pace, I was bemused by my reaction. Reaching the end of the first switchback, I glanced back up at the sky. I was stunned. The entire valley was covered by a thick dark blanket of clouds that extended in all directions but above me the circle had become more distinct and there was the faintest hint of luminous presence behind it i will say so my first trip to india um i was in the mysore room and i you know i had already practiced pretty far into the the ashtanga system but when you go to india you have to start back at the beginning with the teacher to build the foundation 
And so I was doing primary series. And then one day my teacher walks up to me in the middle of my series. He goes, tomorrow you start second. And I looked at him because I'm not a pose chaser. Like most people in the Ashanga world know that I am not a pose chaser. I am totally fine. I, I don't want to go past third series. To me, fourth series looks like a damn exorcism. I do not want to go past third series. And I said to my teacher in the middle of my sermon, I go, are you sure? <laughs> and I heard myself say it. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, he's the parm guru. He's sure. But it was just like, are you sure? Like, do I really need to do more work? <laughs> so I totally get where Tom Kenyon is coming from. I literally began to run down the side of the ridge, which was both a ridiculous reaction on my part and somewhat dangerous due to the presence of loose rocks on the ground. One wrong step and I could have been sent careening down the side of the steep hill. Getting to the end of the trail, I didn't look back. I took off straight away across a large meadow that separated me from Labadou. Normally, I would have taken the trail that followed the edge of the meadow and then turned left onto a road that had once been a walking and wagon path between Labado and the ancient towns of Ren Le Bay. But the shortest distance between the two points is a straight, it's a straight line, not a triangle. Time was of the essence, and so I began to run through the meadow straight for the trees that encircled Labado. As I reached a small bridge that crossed over the meadow onto the grounds, I glanced back up at the sky. The circle of cloud had thinned, and a faint outline of sun was clearly visible. It was here that I entered an intellectual debate. The Acturian had said that he would clear the sky to make the sun clearly visible. One could, by definition, say that this would require the sun to not be veiled at all, but clearly unobstructed by any degree of cloud. Holding onto the shred of possibility, I bolted over the bridge onto the grounds of Labado and bounded up the outside stairs that led to an apartment where Judy and I were staying. Reaching the French doors that led from the balcony to our quarters, I looked up at the sky. The clouds within the cloud circle had thinned further. I could clearly see the sun except for the thinnest layer of light, gray cloud between it and me. The rest of the valley was still soaked in by dark clouds in all direction. I would find out years later that this Acturian's name was Repoius. And by the time of our first encounter, I could have cared less. I had, after all, psychologically regressed to a type of tortoise who preferred to tuck his head into his shell rather than step out of his well-appointed perceptional box. And I want to point something out here that's also kind of comical. So this Octurian, you know, Tom Kenyon, rightly so, was like, if you want me to channel this message, you're going to have to prove to me that you are actually real and not just a figment of my imagination. So can you just like appear to me and just show me you're real? And I want you guys to realize what he said. He said coming down into human form was too low vibrational, was too much for him to do. What would be easier for the Octarian to do would be to literally part the, the, the clouds so you could see the sun. So I want you guys to take that in, the daunting experience of being human, like how hard it actually is to be human, to be in this dense physical world that even the Octarian was like, listen, parting the clouds and showing you the sun is going to be far easier on me than actually appearing to you in a physical body. Like just take that in for a second and then give yourself some grace, give yourself some mercy because humaning is fucking hard. We're in a very dense third density planet that is just full of friction and heaviness, right? So just take that in for a second and then pat yourself on the back for being able to handle incarnating on this level of 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 life of of, a, of an earth plane yeah okay that's that's another reason why a lot of the angels and the intergalactics people say and i've had this memory of them bowing before us because we were either <laughs> we were either the ones brave enough to do this or stupid enough to do this Maybe they're one and the same. I don't know. I don't know. But we're actually doing it. And it's really hard. And that's why we get a lot of a lot of street cred, a lot of um, support from the off worlders and the intergalactic beings, because this shit is hard. Their side is easier than ours. All right. So just give yourself give yourself some mercy. Go buy yourself some flowers. Take your absence.
take your Epsom salt bath, do everything you need to do. That was actually my alarm to remind me to go to the bank, which I've already done, but I forgot to, to take off the alarm, but I'm going to take that as a God wink. It was God being like, yeah, you, you pat yourself on the back because this is hard. All right. Whirling sounds a short time after my unexpected encounter with Refios, I hope I'm saying that right. The Acturian up on the ridge above Labo, I began to hear strange whirling sounds. As the voice of the Acturian, I did not hear sounds with my physical ears. They were psychic impressions of hearing that is sometimes called clear audience. These strange psychic sounds had a mind altering effect on me, and I would often hear them coming out of nowhere while I was hiking in the area when meditating. Several days after these psychic impressions started, I had the knowingness that these whirling sounds were from the Octurian starship that was temporarily based in Mount Bugar. Let me say right here, by the term of knowingness, I mean a type of psychic revelation. I did not then and do not now put this type of intuitive knowledge in the same category as objective, verifiable information. Intuitive insight is an interesting capability of human intelligence, and it carries a kind of emotional aha feeling. But just because we have an aha feeling that we have hit the mark does not, in my experience, indicate that the insight is necessarily accurate. I have had instances where I felt strongly about something only to find that I was wrong. This process of attaining true and accurate information via our intuitive facilities is fascinating and an important inquiry but for the sake of saying focus on the primary topic i will be brief objective information is ver verifiable through our five senses or in a case of some scientific experiments through a precise analysis of data intuitive inf information can sometimes be verified objectively but sometimes not if I lose my car keys and have a psychic impression that I left them in a place I normally don't put them, that psychic insight can be verified by going to the place that was revealed to me by intuition. Verifying the existence of an Octurian starship through objective means is another category altogether. The existence of such a thing is essentially unverifiable, objectively speaking. Or to be more precise, it was unverifiable for me at the time of my first encounter. I personally put these types of unverifiable psychic insights into a type of logical limbo, which I call might be true or might not be true. One of the challenges with strong psychic impressions is that they carry a sense of mental, emotional profundity, that aha feeling that I mentioned early. But a sense of something being true does not make it true. I am reminded here of a strange incident that took place over three decades ago. An acquaintance of mine had become obsessed with the topic of aliens. She lived and breathed it. One night, while watching the star-studded sky, she sent out a prayer to her cosmic brothers and sisters to please come and pick her up. Listen, sister, I've been there. Abort mission. <laughs> I've totally been there. I get it. At that very moment, a meteor burst into flames as it made its arc into our atmosphere. The person suddenly had the strong psychic knowingness that her prayer would be answered, and her certainty was further confirmed due to the fact that she had mentally received the exact coordinates where she would be picked up. She quit her job, sold her belongings. She would, after all, have no need of these things in her new life among the stars. I think he's talking about derangement, though, and delusional thinking which is big in our community too. It's a lot of delusional thinking, so I'm glad he's talking about that. She drove out into the desert of New Mexico and waited. She waited and waited. She kept out on a desert floor for days and nights on end until she ran out of food and water. Her cosmic brothers and sisters did not come pick her up. Depressed and nearly broke, she somehow managed to drive back home to her friends and family who looked at her askance and as if she were some kind of crazy person. She had unwittingly been duped by what I call the delusional factor. Just said that. This type of mental inaccuracy can creep up on us whenever we enter a new territory or field of knowledge. 
Those who enter altered states of consciousness are especially prone to this if they do not balance their intuitive pressions with equal counterforce logic. That's what we've been talking about on this channel and also on the Telegram channel Enough is Enough. We've been talking about this as well. With so many things in life, balance is key. This need for balance shows up in how our very brains are organized, by the way. We humans have brains with two halves to our neurocortex. One part of the neurocortex where we think logically and another part is more intuitive. To live in the world without access to our intuitive potential is a type of mental impoverishment. To live in a world without access to our logical potential is also a type of mental impoverishment and in some cases foolish and dangerous as well. My position on the matter is to be open to intuitive and psychic impressions and weigh them against verifiable facts and information. Boom! Boom, 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 boom. Yes, you cannot just go off into these, these junk conspiracies and be living in la-la land of delusion, allowing then the New World Order just to walk right into the front door because my, my psychic impression tells me it's so. No, that's mental derangement. That's delusion. The sixth chakra, the pineal gland right here, is not going to work unless muladhara is working properly, which is your root chakra. Yes. Hopefully those in the back heard that and we can get off of the delusional thinking and come right back down. Look, as I've been saying, where are your feet? Look down. Where are your fucking feet? On the ground. The Hathors talked about this as well. You came here to be a human. You are a spiritual being having a human experience. So have that human experience. Don't try to wish your life away by being in the la-la land of the deranged woo-woo and ignoring your physical life here on earth. That is not, that is spiritual bypassing. That is not enlightenment. That is absolute spiritual bypassing. You will not ascend that way. So I'm glad they're bringing this up again. But back to the whirling sounds I was hearing in my mind. I was fascinated by these sounds and found that if I listened to them with my full attention, I was trans transported to the very expanded states of consciousness. Some of these expanded states were exhilarating and some of them, quite frankly, were difficult to contend with since they seemed to push me past my personal energetic limits. I was intrigued. I was also possessed by an all-consuming desire to capture these psychic impressions in a recording, which was quite a challenge since they were not audible range of hearing at all. Undeterred by this, I set up my portable recording studio and began to record vocal sounds that approximated what I was hearing. I would record late at night when the birds had gone to sleep in the trees that surrounded La Labado. I would work previously fervishly, excuse me, until three o'clock and dawn to capture the layers of the sounds before the birds awakened from their slumber to sing in a new day. I layered vocal sounds on top of vocal sounds for many nights. How many exactly, I do not recall, but it spanned at least two weeks, sometimes during this odyssey, and especially towards the end, I had the impression that the Acturian was guiding me to shape the vocal sounds to more accurately capture the psychic impressions I had been hearing. When I finished with laying the tracks, I had 24 of them. During the final phase of mixing, I had a strong sense that the Acturian was standing beside me. With his approval of the final versions, I listened to the 60-some minutes of the recording. It was very close match to what I had been hearing. I call the piece light shift. To this day, when I listened to the recording, I experienced similar reactions to those that occurred when I first heard those psychic sounds, impressions from the Acturian starship. I find it interesting that many people have reported similar reactions to it as I did. Some say they love it, and some say they find it difficult to listen to. Even today, when I listen to pieces, there are times when I'm drawn into it and transported to expanded states of mind and body. Then there are times when I turn the thing off just after a minute or two. I believe this variation in reactions is due to differences in vibratory responses. 
By this, I mean that certain tones and timbres, sound quality, appeal to some people, while the same tones will repel others. Not only this, but I find that when I am in a certain frame of mind, I am drawn to certain tonalities in music. But if I am in a very different mental or emotional state, I might not be attracted by the same tonality. In fact, it might be the last thing on earth that I would want to listen to. I chalk all of this to the relative of perception, both the relativity of perception between people and the re relativity of perception between the vibratory states or frames of mind within myself. With this completion of this recorded project, I felt that I have completed some type of contract with the Acturians and I put the whole thing behind me. But my adventure with these ignatic beings was only just beginning. I will say, guys, this book also comes with a CD, just like the Hathor material did, which I still haven't listened to. So when I'm on the road, I'm actually probably going to play this and see what I feel when I'm listening to these soundtracks, right? An unexpected transport. My next encounter with the Octurians also occurred at Labado, this time about a year later. After looking back at it from my current vantage point, it still strikes me as a truly odd and extraordinarily bizarre experience. The entire affair was neither anticipated nor invited. In other words, I was minding my own business. It was early spring and the sky was a cauldron of opposing forces. Winds were sweeping in from opposite directions and white fluffy tendrils of clouds were snatched up by the fury of the winds. Dark and monstrously large thunderclouds loomed off to the north and the sky above me altered between clear radiant blue and pelting rain. I marveled at the contrast between blue sky and thick heavy raindrops because the rain was not falling from above me it was falling about a kilometer or so off to the north from those mincing giants that afternoon i had taken off one of my longest hikes along the old trail that led past labado to the distant town of rain le bay although this trail did not lead up the ridge that i so often frequented i loved it nonetheless I had come upon a juncture in the road where an old weathered board pointed in the direction of Rain Le, Rain Le Bay. But if I went straight ahead, I would go past a farmhouse whose land backed up against a large ridge of exposed rocks that flanked one end of the valley. If I turned left, following the sign, I would be taken to the beginning of a long trail that meandered like a twisting serpent through a thick forest of scrubby trees that stretched as far as the eye could see. I turned left towards Rain Le Bay and I entered the scrubby forest. After a short while, the trail began to rise at a steep angle. Pausing to look behind me, I was stunned by nature's display in the valley below. I do not know if this was actually the case or not. Perhaps it was an optical illusion, but it seemed to me that I was at a higher elevation than the tiny mountain village of Rain Le Chateau off in the distance. The sky was a brilliant azure blue, dotted here and there with tendrils of white clouds that had been cleaved by the wind. The dark, ominous thunderclouds off to the north were growing in size, and shockwaves of thunder rolled across the valley. Q-A-C-D-C, thunder, right? That's what I got in my head when he said that, shockwaves of thunder. Some ACDC right there. Then for a moment, the rain stopped. The air was filled with the smell of fresh water that had fallen from the skies, and the world seemed perfect. So I walked back down the hill towards the valley floor in Labado. The sun set the western horizon ablaze with fiery reds and brilliant golds. By the time I reached our little apartment, the sun was gone, and the valley had been cast into a strange, magical enchantment called twilight. After a dinner of potatoes and some leftover ratoli, Judy and I read a bit and went to bed. Tired from my afternoon hike, I fell into a deep and dreamless sleep. Then, for no apparent reason, I woke up just before 5 a.m. And not just awake, mind you, but bolt alert. I glanced at the bedside clock on Judy's nightstand and watched as the digital numbers changed to five. 
So he woke up in Brahma Morta. It was then that it happened. A part of me was being pulled off into the direction of Mount Bur Burgark. Had I not encountered these types of psychic impressions many times before, I would have been spooked. But I was quite calm. I knew that I was being taken aboard the Octurian spaceship. And I knew that I was safe. I was also in full possession of my logical facilities and pondered if I might be having a psychotic break or perhaps a mental anomaly caused by overexertion. I unabated, unabated by my thoughts, the psychic impressions began to flow into me at a fast rate of speed. I could clearly pull myself out of this altered state if I wished, but if I relaxed, the psychic impressions became more vivid. One minute, I was lying in my bed, bemused by the torrent of psychic impressions, and then the next minute, my awareness of the bedroom vanished. I was clearly inside the starship, or so it would seem to my altered mental state. I was greeted by the same Octurian that I had encountered before. The same one who spoke to me up on the ridge, and the same one who had helped me record the sounds of lightship. He spoke matter-of-factly, as if nothing unusual was taking place. Follow me, he said. And with those two words, he led me down a long passageway. This passage, however, was like nothing else I had ever seen. It was more like a long tube with fascinating glyphs here and there on the rounded walls. Holy shit. I think I've been on this ship. As I was reading that, I, holy shit, that sounds very familiar. I have a very a visual memory that I've spoken about before. Anyway, they were truly intriguing and I reached out to touch one. He grabbed my hand and said, don't touch those. After what seemed to be several minutes, he stopped and reached out to touch a series of glimpses on the wall. Like the iris of a camera, a round door appeared and slid open. He gestured for me to step through the portal onto the other side. As we both cleared the opening, it closed like the iris, leaving no visible sign of its existence. I was now in what appeared to be some type of mess hall with a group of such diverse characters that it reminded me of the bar scene from the movie Star Wars. I've never seen Star Wars. Don't come at me. I just have no I have no desire. Why am I going to go watch Star Wars? I'm living this shit. Like, why am I going to go watch it? Like, no, I'm already living this shit. Like, come on. My Acturian host gestured for me to sit at an empty table. He then walked over to the counter and retrieved a cup from some type of device. Drink it, it said. He said it will help stabilize your energy field. Maybe it was a Sia. I must have looked at him with some type of blank expression because he continued, if you don't intake something of the same vibratory rate of this vessel, you will not be able to remain here long. He motioned me to drink, and as I swallowed the liquid, which tasted oddly sweet, but with no other discernible taste, I noticed someone, or perhaps I should say something, sitting at one of the nearby tables. I would later discover that he was not Octurian. He reminded me of a giant lobster and human all rolled into one. He had distinctly human features, except that his head was bald and boyous with a huge single eye at the center. Ah, uh, yes, I said to myself, some type of cyclops. But one of, his masses, but one of his massive arms resembled the claw of a crustacean. I couldn't take my eyes off of him. He stood up and walked right over to where I was sitting. He was huge, maybe 10 feet tall. And he seemed to be quite agitated. He spoke with a booming and raspy voice. So, do you think I look odd? There was a hushed silence in the room. All eyes were on me. Well, yes, I said. But then I imagine I must look odd to you. He grinned and the whole room burst out laughing. The Acturian motioned to me and said, it's time to take you up to the captain. I followed him to the far side of the room and watched as he touched some lips on the wall. An iris-like round door opened and he led me down another long passageway. As we walked toward the far end of the tunnel-like hallway, I asked him who the fellow was that I had encountered. Oh, he's the navigator. 
navigator? I asked incredulously. Yes, the navigator. You'll find a lot of different crew members on this vessel. And a few of them are not Octarian. We reached the end of the passageway and my host touched another series of lips on the wall. Just as before, an iris-like round doorway appeared. We stepped into a small conference room with a long, narrow table, something like 12 chairs. I don't recall the exact number since another Octurian, obviously the captain, entered the room along with a small entourage. I see the stabilizing drink is working, said the captain. I mean, seriously, like, guys, is that what a SIA is? Like, that's going to be goosebumps that my sponsorship that I love is this liquid that has helped me. That's why I think I have so much energy today. It's like brought me vitality back. Now we're talking about drinking something that's stable. Like, I believe the formula for a SIA was given to the guy through intergalactic telepathy that's just my opinion i don't know if that's his opinion so this is kind of making me a little bit like whoa right you mean the drink that i was handed in the mess hall i asked yes that one since your energetic body is now stabilized to the same vibration as this ship you will be able to stay here a bit longer when the effects of the liquid wear off you will be unable to remain on the ship until then i invite you to tour the bridge and get a sense of how we do things here but there is something I wish to ask you first. What I ask? I believe that you and I have different views on the nature of compassion. I would like to describe an action I took as the captain of the starship, and you tell me if it was compassionate or not. I was a bit perplexed by his request, but said, okay. A few months ago, by your sense of time, we were patrolling the outer reaches of your solar system. Our mission in this quadrant is to protect Earth from nefarious intergalactic travelers. We discovered a starship from another galaxy hiding in a fifth dimensional place. I concluded that they were a direct threat to your planet due to the fact that they were feeders. Feeders, I asked? Yes. These types of entities feed off of negative emotions in humans, and not just humans, mind you, but any type of sentient being. In addition to feeding off of negative emotions such as fear, they like to generate conflict. Your planet has enough contention already from other intergalactic interference without having these nasty types making matters even worse. So what happened? I asked. Once we discovered them, they fired on us without provocation. What did you do? I asked. I counterattacked. And with our superior firepower, I reduced them to rubble. I ensure that there would be no survivors who might still be able to inflict your world. I pulverized their ship into subatomic particles. Sensing my distaste for the situation, he looked me straight in the eyes. Do you think that was compassionate act on my part? He asked without a challenge in his voice. I'm not sure. Well, I am, he said. Compassion is always relative to the situation. And it was far more compassionate for me to obliterate this intergalactic menace than allow them to infect your planet or any other planet for that matter. I'll have to think about that, I said. You do that, he said with a note of defiance in his voice. And now if you will excuse me, I have some duties to attend to. Your host will show you the bridge before it's time for you to leave. I think you will find it most interesting. And that's something I'm learning too, like with all the attacks that I've taken. I have to return to Descender. I was giving it to the light because I didn't want to hurt anybody, even though they were putting death spells on me drinking my blood which i will show pictures of that at some point but it looks like to actually have that happen to you um but i now know i have to sit return it to sender i have to i have to actually send it back to those who are doing it to me so buckle up buttercups my guy took me to the bridge where ironically the navigator and i had met earlier was sitting he looked up as we entered and he seemed to be more at ease I thought I even detected a slight smile. 
That was a good response from you back in the mess hall, my guide whispered, recognizing that you must have looked as strange to him as he did to you was a good one. The Octurian proceeded to show me the navigational system for the starship with the assistance of the navigator. The central feature of the system was a large visual display with icons that simultaneously tracked the vessel's location in three-dimensional space as well as its dimensional location, meaning which dimension the vessel was residing in. After being shown the navigation system, I was taken to the pilot station. The pilot controlled the starship slowly through his or her mind. An interface between the mind of the pilot and the intelligence of the starship allowed the pilot to move the vessel according to his or her intent. There were no external controls that I could see. It seemed to me that my time on the Octurian starship had lasted for many, many hours and I was starting to get tired. Perhaps the drink's effects were beginning to wear off, but for whatever reason, I started to feel drained from the experience. I don't recall what the transition was like from starship to bedroom, but it was rapid. One moment I was on the starship and the next I was lying on our bed. Although my logical mind was struggling with the encounter, I marveled at the vividness of my experience on the ship and with the captain. I looked over at the clock on Judy's nightstand and it stopped and it had stopped at 5 a.m. I stared at it for a while, noting that it was no longer working and then fell asleep. When I woke up, the clock was still stuck on 5 a.m. I fiddled with it some and got it to start working again, but I had to reset time. And speaking of that, speaking of a SIA, speaking of an intergalactic drink, let's take a quick word from our sponsors before we finish up this episode. The Channeling Session. You are about to read the transcript of several channeling sessions that took place over the course of several months. And if you might sense when you're reading their words, each of the Acturians had distinct personalities and unique perspectives regarding the nature of reality in our human as well as Acturian potentials. But before you jump into the Octarian perspective, I invite you to put the imaginary box by your side, and I suggest you do so before you read their section. Know, too, that words are not their first choice for communicating of ideas. They prefer telepathic holography, an interesting psychic phenomenon whereby a body of information is psychically conveyed that contains all knowledge relevant to the topic. During the channeling session, various Octurians would commit, would comment on the primitive nature of our language. Part of this has to do with the speed at which information can be imparted. What might take an Octurian a nanosecond to convey to another Octurian might take an hour or more to be spoken. And the spoken word can never capture the full meaning of what is being conveyed. Another interesting paradox around Octurian communication has to do with time. Our language is based on the use of tenses, as in present tense, past tense, and future tense. We relate all events and situations to their orientation in time as occurring either in the past, in the present, or in the future. But Octurian views events and situations simultaneously from multiple perspectives. If they are dealing with something in the present moment, they will see the current event or situation and its relationship to both the past and the future with all variables involved. All of this is viewed simultaneously since by their nature as higher dimensional beings, Octurians tend to see the present, the past, and the future as an all occurring at the same time. 
It is only when you descend into third dimensional reality where we live that a linear progression of time makes sense. There was a humorous moment during one of the sessions when Ektara, an Acturian science officer, was giving his take on things. At one point in his transmission, he started laughing. He had just discovered the reason that our syntax, the meaning, meaning the order of our words and the necessity for punctuation as a means to delineate small sections of information from other sections of information. He even began to dictate punctuation, putting a comma here and a parenthesis there and so on. It's like those old telegrams. Dear so-and-so, stop, period. I forgive you period, exclamation point. <laughs> anyway, one of the strongest impressions during this channeling process came from the Acturian who called himself Sanat Kumara. He spoke quite eloquently and passionately about his perspective, but his personal energy was, was what caught my attention. I had been doing this type of work, channeling, for over two decades, and I am usually do it lying down in order to enter more deeply into receptive trance state. But when Sinet entered my energy field, I became supercharged with excess energy. I couldn't lie down. I had to sit up, and on more than one occasion, I walked around the room dictating his words. To be in the midst of such an immense energetic being was truly exhilarating. But after the session was finished, I would often have to lie down and rest for a bit. Each of the Octarians in this anthology offers a unique perspective, and I imagine that each of us will have his or her favorites. For me, one of the most fascinating Octarians was Frefios. Again, I don't know if I'm saying that right. The one who made first contact with me up on the ridge of Lebo. I have often found it interesting how people can and often do experience events differently. In this case of Frefios, I found this to be both poignant and amusingly the case. Final thoughts. Some ideas can be catalysts for personal growth and evolution regardless of their origins. I also think that some ideas are inherently radical, meaning they have the potential to change our perception of reality. Take for instance, the history of physics and the shift from a solely Newtonian-based perception to include the radical idea of quantum physics. In one fell swoop, it was as if the underlying laws of our everyday world were turned upside down. Instead of the solid predictability and logic of Newtonian's reality, a young upstart called quantum mechanics looked at the sum atomic realm of reality and noted that it was neither predictable nor logical. In point of fact, however, these two worlds the Newtonian and the quantum actually exist side by side quite nice, nicely. Prakriti and Purusha, Shiva Shakti. It just took physicists several decades to conduct enough experiments to verify that both theories were accurate, depending upon which level of reality the macro or the micro, was being observed and to integrate such revolutionary concepts as quantum theory into our thinking. Radical ideas tend to take time to be integrated into the mainstream of society. While some catalytic ideas are scientific in nature, such as the quantum theory, others are most more social in their consequences. The idea that all human beings are born with inalienable rights was highly radical concept a few centuries ago. Some radical ideas involve the revision of history. As in, for instance, the recognition that Columbus did not, in fact, discover the Americas since both the continents and their indigenous people had existed prior to the European incursion of the late 1400s. Oh, Tom Kenyon, you must not be familiar with Tartaria, honey. Bless your heart. Listen, honey. Listen, Tom. White people were here long before Columbus. Look up Tartaria. Look at the history books from the 1800s. They, they call in the history books from the 1800s. They said the Native Americans were all races, which points back to Tartaria. So, boo, listen, Columbus, 
you got to get rid of that shit guy. Like, like probably you and my ancestors, Tom, probably did not come over here on a boat. Some of mine did, I know, because I know when they came over. But most of them are probably already here. Actually, I would love, I would love, if you guys know Tom Kenyon, send him my way. I would love to talk to him about Tartaria. The mud floods, the incubator babies, all that stuff. All right. Here at the beginning of the 21st century, advances in science and technology are rapidly introducing new radical ideas into our collective at an increasingly faster rate. Indeed, many of us are experiencing what the futuristic Alvin Topher, Topher called future shock, i.e. we are experiencing too much change in too short a time. But whether we are psychologically stunned or not by the changes taking place all around us, our collective perception of reality and our future history will be, for better or worse, increasingly shaped by both science and technology. It is here in this context that I find the Acturian perspective to be quite interesting. If one accepts the notion that the Acturians are technologically advanced and higher dimensional intergalactic civilization, then their perception of us and our potential could prove helpful. If nothing else, these radical Acturian ideas might assist us to think outside the box of our own conditioned perception. While writing this final portion of my introduction, I had an interesting encounter. I had arranged to meet some friends for dinner in Manhattan, and they had taken a cab from Brooklyn to pick up Judy and me. En route to the restaurant, we got into a discussion with the cab driver. We were amazed that he knew exactly where the restaurant was in the small alley where it was located. He had explained that he had been driving a cab for 18 years and that at first he refused to go into Manhattan. If someone asked him to drive from Brooklyn to Manhattan, he would decline. He said it was very scary for him to even think about driving into such a big city. Y'all, if you, when I had Twitter, if you guys were following me on Twitter, I drove straight through New York City and I was filming it the whole time. I am, maybe I'm a little, I just, or maybe it's because I grew up driving in a city. I don't know. Like, I learned how to drive in a city. I don't know. But I'm like, why are people afraid to drive in New York? Why? Why? I drove through LA. Like, it's just a road. Like, you just drive like you drive you know and you move lanes and you the same protocol it's the same protocol in small towns it's just a few more cars like why are you this is what cracks me up about humans it's like why are you afraid to drive in new york i don't understand like it's just driving just follow the signs follow the laws you got this it's fine if you're afraid, I'll drive for you because it's not that hard. It really driving through New York is not that hard. It's like uh, what's that illegally blonde where he's like, "L, you got into Harvard," and she's like, "What? Like it's hard." Same thing I feel about driving through New York. People are like, "You drove? You drive through New York City? What? Like it's hard?" It's not hard. Anyway. Then one day a woman hailed him and she told him she wanted to go to Manhattan. He said he couldn't take her. She asked him why and he told her that he had never been and was afraid he would get lost. She told him that she lived right over the bridge and all he had to do was to drive over the bridge, drop her off and take a U-turn and head back into Brooklyn. So that day he took his first trip from Brooklyn into the metropolis of Manhattan. But what impressed me is how he self-reflected on that moment in his past. He said, and I quote, when I drove over the bridge, I just stepped out of my mental box and suddenly driving in Manhattan was not a problem for me anymore. Exactly. It's just driving. Just driving. What do you think is going to happen? Like, if you go into New York, you think all of a sudden, like, the roads are going to change? The laws are going to change? Like, no, it's just driving. It's just drive. That's all it is. I think for some, if not many of us, the Octarian perspective may be far out of our comfort or should we say familiar zones. If you are one of these persons, I suggest reading this material in small sections. Then mentally take a U-turn and return to your more familiar sense of reality. Mull over what you've read, think about it, and keep what you find of value. What you find of no value or too strange to even consider simply toss into your imaginary box. The voyage of personal transformation can come in many forms and in many ways. I have personally found the Octarian message you are about to read to be some of the most enigmatic and potentially mind-opening material I've ever come across. And I truly wish you a bon 
voyage. Thank you.